Goddard Space Flight Center, 15 miles northeast of Washington, D.C., March 16th, 1961. At this place on this day, Robert Hutchings Goddard is remembered and honored by a grateful America. Hutchings Goddard, teacher, inventor, pioneering genius, a man with a dream and a mission. Share with us now one of the great untold stories of our time. The only child of Fanny and Nahum Goddard, Robert grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, a shy and sickly child. At 15, he tried and failed to build a balloon destined for outer space. At Worcester Polytech, as a student, he wrote of atomic-powered rockets and interplanetary space travel. At Clark University, as a graduate student, he set out in 1909 on a life work that was to change the course of human history. His burning dream became the exploration of outer space the development of rockets that would soar into the heavens and eventually reach the moon. In 1919, he actually spoke of a rocket that on reaching the moon would discharge a magnesium flare visible on Earth. Newspapers promptly seized on the story, and from then on, Robert Goddard became the moon rocket man. Some papers were friendly, others were not. A sensitive, dedicated pioneer had learned a painful lesson. From then on, he would pursue his work and keep his silence. There is only one person alive today who knows the untold story of Robert Goddard. Listen as his wife, Mrs. Esther Goddard, takes you back to 1925. I can still remember my husband, Bob, coming home to this house from Clark University one afternoon in December of 1925 with his dark eyes shining. He told me with great excitement that that afternoon at his laboratory, his little liquid propellant rocket motor had lifted its own weight and even a little more. Now it is ready to take out into the open, he said. On March 16, 1926, from this spot, the fragile little rocket lifted itself lightly into the air, turned in that direction for a bit, and fell in a patch of ice and snow. The flight lasted about three seconds. Here at the Kitty Hawk of rocketry, Robert Goddard had breathed life into the giant that had slumbered in the liquid-propelled rocket. It was a crude beginning at best. Goddard pressed on, building a bigger launching tower, then an observation shack, experimenting with a new hoop skirt design, and learning that progress often follows a pattern of success and setback. Four times in the years after 1926 did our little lovely take to the air, each time a little farther, affording encouragement for the mishaps in between. The fourth time was in 1929, when the flight was high enough and noisy enough to constitute a fire hazard, and it was wisest for us to move to less populated areas. And so, in 1930, we moved to Roswell, New Mexico, not far from today's White Sand Missile Range, where Bob set up a shop and testing ground. For the next 12 years, he labored eagerly, painstakingly, successfully on the dream that had become his single radiant goal. The films you are about to see tell his story tell it as only a handful of people has ever seen it or known it. 
for these motion pictures are my husband's own living record of his pioneer rocket experiments. Here, Goddard constructed and tested scores of rockets, cataloging each experiment as he sought to confirm propulsion theories and engineering solutions, often with spectacular results. Always the search was for a motor that would withstand the extremely high pressure and temperature generated by the jet flame. Now from pre-launch to recovery, you are to witness a Goddard rocket firing, filmed 31 years ago, when rocketry and space flights were looked upon as utterly fantastic, unbelievably ridiculous, and a crackpot's dream. But as you watch, you will see many of the procedures that are carried out today by the missile men who are heirs to Dr. Goddard's incredible genius. The firing begins with the unveiling of the rocket, covered as today's missiles are to protect delicate mechanisms from dust and dirt. In 1930, Dr. Goddard's rocket was 11 feet long and weighed 33 pounds empty. An amazing growth in the four years since the firing of his first little rocket. The inventor's early research had been sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution. His work in New Mexico was to be completely financed by the Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Foundation. The total cost for 20 years of experimentation was some $200,000. Today, one atlas costs 10 times that. Dr. Goddard was the commanding general of the pioneer missile range that you see, supervising the launching operation down to the last detail, and then running to join his assistants in the car that would transport them 1,000 feet to the control center that was history's first blockhouse. These men knew, as those who followed in their footsteps would know, the mounting excitement of a countdown as each one took his assigned position. Then the final fateful seconds. Three, two, one, fire. The rocket climbed to a height of 2,000 feet and reached a top speed of 500 miles an hour. An astonishing achievement signaled by the first of many mushroom clouds to rise over the New Mexico desert. But the experiment was not finished. The job was not done. Once again, the Pioneer missile men took to their car for the recovery of the rocket's shattered remains. It was a ritual that was to be repeated and copied down to today. Each twisted scrap held some clue, some secret to be used in future flights. And Dr. Goddard kept meticulous and detailed notes. In his lifetime, he compiled 22 volumes of ideas for rocket propulsion, design, launching, controls, and flight in space. From out of the past, a toasted milk captures the kinship of the Goddard team after a successful flight. Not all launchings were successful, however, and here you will see three spectacular failures. Charles Lindbergh was among the rare visitors to the missile range. He had known Dr. Goddard in Massachusetts, had been impressed with his work, and had been instrumental in arranging for the initial Guggenheim Foundation grant. Sharing Lindbergh's keen interest in the rocket experiments was Daniel Guggenheim's son, Harry, who continued to finance Goddard's work. An average of a rocket a month in all shapes and sizes rolled off the assembly line at the workshop. One of Goddard's assistants was to say later, there was never so much invention with so little manpower. Parachute recovery techniques, another Goddard first, were tested and refined. 
Dr. Goddard's own motion pictures record one of history's earliest parachute recoveries. Like all these films, they were made by Mrs. Goddard, who oftentimes sewed the parachutes herself. Watch now as the chute opens and the rocket floats gently back to Earth. Here was still another stride forward in rocket research, for instruments could be packed in nose cones and recovered intact. At the same time, Goddard rockets were becoming more complex, more advanced. Stabilization and steering devices had been added, including a gyroscope and moving vanes set in the jet exhaust stream, devices later found in the German V-2s. There were literally hundreds of parts on each rocket, many of them machined by his skilled staff. As the missiles traveled higher and faster, the instrument packages became more and more important. Barometers, thermometers, recorders for measuring altitude, each found its way into the nose cone. Twenty-two feet long, Weighing 500 pounds when loaded with fuel, this was one of Dr. Goddard's last rockets. Powered by liquid oxygen, launched when ready by remote control, it recalls the story of a captured German scientist questioned after World War II about the V-2 rocket bombs. Why do you ask me these questions, he said. Why don't you ask your own rocket pioneer, Dr. Goddard? We learned these things by studying him. It was the final irony for a man labeled impractical by America's own military leaders. But Robert Hutchings Goddard was not an embittered man. He was a conscientious and devoted scientist, doing what he wanted to do more than anything else in the world, seeing his burning dream through his rockets, coming closer and closer to reality until his death in 1945. For 16 years in Worcester, Robert Goddard's memory has remained bright and clear in the heart and mind of the wife who shared his untold story. These years brought maturity and understanding to the wife of a man who had long withstood skepticism and ridicule with serene and steadfast confidence in the value of his work. Watching him work, I came to know that my husband marched to his own drum. He once wrote that the first flight was significant, but few took notice at that time. Today, the public has caught up, and he is being honored in many ways and in many places. One is the coveted Langley Medal which since its inception in 1910 has been granted to only nine men, awarded for the increase and diffusion of knowledge among men, it was voted to Robert Hutchings Goddard in 1959. Two years later, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, America pays its homage as the Congressional Gold Medal is presented by Congressman Overton Brooks. It is only through the genius of men like Dr. Goddard, who was not afraid to work for what he believed in, that we shall maintain the spirit and the vitality that has made our country great. This medal, authorized by Congress in behalf of all of the people, is but a small token from a grateful nation. Mrs. Goddard, my privilege to present this to you, Pastor. As a second part of the dedication ceremonies, a bust of Dr. Goddard is unveiled. In warm, simple words, Mrs. Goddard expresses her thanks. I hope that this bust and the man it represents will serve as an inspiration not only to the brilliant and dedicated people who are now at work at this tremendous space flight center, 
but to all those who may work here in the years to come. My husband would be deeply proud and happy for this very great tribute. Thank you. Such are the tangible tributes to the shining vision of Robert Goddard. But perhaps the highest honor of all is to be found in the words of this exclusive statement of Dr. Werner von Braun. It is a great honor for me to take part in this motion picture tribute to my boyhood hero, Dr. Robert Goddard, and to discuss his contributions to science. However belated, the recognition accorded to Dr. Goddard is eminently deserved. Like other scientists working in novel and little understood fields, venturing into unknowns fraught with hazards, he did not live to see the fruits of his successful work. But rocketry in this country and abroad owes a great deal to his vision. And in the light of what has happened since his death, we can only wonder what might have been if America realized earlier the implications of his work. I have not the slightest doubt that the United States today would enjoy unchallenged leadership in space exploration had Dr. Goddard received adequate support and recognition. And so, remember him well, for this was a giant in the pioneer age of rocketry. His contributions are every day helping Johnny come lately's achieve his shining ambition, the exploration of the planets, stars, and galaxies that await the adventurers who follow in his giant steps. The untold story of Robert Hutchings Goddard is told at last. And through its telling is rekindled and renewed the blazing spirit of a great and gifted American who must surely in time take his rightful place among the immortals of science. It is a place richly earned by a man who found a dream and would not give it up. A man who could truly see beyond the years. Each gleaming giant thrusting skyward from its launching pad, sending satellites and someday men into the heavens, is its own memorial to Robert Goddard. Each new journey into space reawakens the words he spoke in his high school commencement address long ago. It is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. <laughs>